uh, first strike series that I wrote uh, was basically inspired by a guy named Vasily Arkhipov. And uh, Vasily Arkhipov, uh, for those who aren't familiar with him, was the uh, captain of the uh, uh, B-59 Foxtrot uh, that uh, Khrushchev sent uh, on a mission to uh, protect his ships that were carrying the missiles in October of, of 1962. And uh, I take that in, uh, in book three and I tell it from uh, the Russian side and the uh, experiences that uh, he had as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, political officer on board the uh, B-59. And I take uh, his particular character and uh, uh, embellish it just a little bit, not much, but uh, he was the uh, captain, not the captain, but one of the officers on the K-19. And the K-19, of course, was the nuclear submarine that the uh, Soviets had, which uh, the reactor nuclear reactor went bad and uh, he was responsible for saving a bunch of people on board there and uh, a lot of heroic Russian uh, seamen died on that day because they went down and uh, they fixed that nuclear reactor and were exposed to so much radiation that they died a miserable death within three or four days. But I took his character and I, I sent him to the, uh, to the uh, GRU, KGB, offices and and they filled him in on the fact that hey we're seriously outgunned here um the uh, united states has uh three or four thousand deliverable nuclear warheads and we have only about four icbms and our our uh, tu-95s uh and our m4 uh, uh you know intercontinental bombers we've only got about 160 of those and they've got probably three to 4,000, you know, planes that can come through and bomb us. So he was imparted with that knowledge before he left on that voyage. And when it got to the critical moment on October 27th of uh, 1962 at, you know, someplace between 5 and 8 p.m. in the evening, uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, his uh, uh, particular submarine had been, uh, located uh, and they were dropping, they were dropping uh, uh, practice depth charges on it, uh, on the uh, uh, particular, on the B-59 and uh, Captain Savitsky uh, and the uh, first officer had decided that they would launch um, a uh, nuclear tip torpedo, which of course the United States did not know that they had. And um, both the uh, captain and the first officer concurred in, in sending that torpedo towards the uh, Essex, which was a US aircraft carrier, which had about three or 4,000 men on it. And uh, they were within range. They had about, uh, I think, uh, they were within, I think, uh, 12,000 yards or something like that and uh, or meters and uh, they uh, uh, were ready to fire it but they needed his approval because of the fact that he was the uh, assistant flotilla commander and he wouldn't give them the permission to fire it because of the knowledge that he had of, of how severely they were outgunned and it would mean death for his family and most everyone in, in Russia. And uh, uh, Arkhipov, uh, you know, singularly stopped uh, World War III, in my opinion. And, you know, that's where I got how, the institution. How do, how, does the, um, how do the nuclear arsenals compare today between uh, Russia and the States? Um, today, um, I think that the Russian assets and the U.S. assets are probably in equipo. I, I don't believe that anyone has a uh, 
uh, certainly what I would call a window of opportunity. Although, I mean, you have to admit that when Lloyd Austin and uh, was uh, was uh, that's the Secretary of Defense for the United States was in the hospital, and uh, the uh, I think the his first assistant in the uh, the Secretary of Defense's office was on vacation, and uh, no one knew where the football was. Um, that was uh, <laughs> certainly a particular hole in uh, in the uh, in the U.S. arsenal. And uh, um, but I mean, let's face it: we live in a world where the U.K., France, and the United States. Uh, all have uh, Ohio class nuclear submarines that uh, even if you don't know where the nuclear football is, uh, there's more than enough megatons on board those submarines to decimate the world. Okay. I mean, I, if you got to that part of my blog where I'm talking about what happens when there's just a regional nuclear war between India and uh, Pakistan, uh, you 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 understand, uh, you know what happens when that much nitrogen oxide goes into the atmosphere, and we have a nuclear we have a nuclear winter, uh, and we have a very severe nuclear winter because the nitrogen oxide uh, and dioxide uh, molecules are uh, they become very buoyant because they absorb the radioactivity. So um, I think that uh, um, certainly China has minimal, what I would call minimal deterrence at this point, and maybe much more so since they're building uh, their silos uh, in the uh, Manchuria area. Um, l last year, w there was, uh, I'm not sure what it was like in, uh, on your side of the pond, but here in the in the UK, there was a definite increase in fear of uh, World War Three, nuclear war, some sort of nuclear attack or or conflict where, where Russia was concerned. Or obviously, all revolving around Ukraine. Um, was it? Do you think it was as as um, what's the word? Serious as what was being made out by the media. Like, were we were we in a very precarious situation last year? Do you think? Based on your knowledge, you know, your historical knowledge of, of uh, nuclear. Um, uh, yes, I, I well, think, yeah, yes, yes, very, very serious. I think if you look at, if you look at the, uh, um, the close calls that I wrote about on one of my blogs, okay, um, <clears throat> all it takes is uh, one particular person that, uh, uh, makes a mistake uh, or doesn't recognize that there's been a system glitch, uh, and you have the first nuclear weapon that's that's set off in anger or meant to harm someone uh, in uh, uh, in just a few seconds, and then you have. Uh, you have a real serious situation as to, well, how's the other side going to respond? I mean, you read the book uh, Fail Safe and, uh, uh, by Eugene Burdick, and, and, and Burdick, uh, you know, in that book, you know, one of the American B-52s reaches the fail safe point and they can't turn it back. And uh, it, it, it drops a bomb on, on Moscow and, and uh, so they're on the phone and they're trying to figure out, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's, what kind of retribution should be, uh, you know, should the, should the Russians be able to bomb New York City or Washington, D.C. with one bomb? And, and uh, um, but we're, we were in a situation where I was, I was afraid that uh, the Russians were going to lose the war. Uh, they're fighting a limited war now, of course. Um, they have tactical nuclear weapons that they could employ and, and other, you know, uh, short-range ballistic missiles that they could employ uh, with, uh, you know, small nuclear warheads on them that could, that could, you know, just 
uh, do away with the Ukraine in a matter of moments. So uh, I was afraid that the Russians would be faced with losing that war and that they would resort to, uh, you know, first of all, tactical nuclear weapons. NATO, re NATO would respond with tactical nuclear weapons. And, you know, once, you know, one side looks like they're losing the tactical nuclear weapon war, then you start with strategics. And, and uh, quite frankly, the, uh, the atmosphere just cannot handle uh, an exchange of that type. So yes, I was, I was very concerned with whether or not, you know, uh, we would uh, need a food storage in our house and, and a bomb shelter. Well, on the, on the subject of the tactical nukes, Thomas, so I have limited understanding in terms of how much damage they can inflict and how tactical they are. Like in my in my mind, that they strike me as just a gateway to like full blown nuclear um, a nuclear conflict, right? Above the tactical, but I don't know how you would describe it. The, the, the megatons that you described, right? So for for a tactical nuke, what? How small is the range? Like how targeted can they be? Like um, you know. Obviously, they have in mind. They, they're, they must be something that's come about with collateral damage in mind, and not city destroying things, right? So, how small can these things target, and what's the what's the lasting impact afterwards? You know, we know how long areas of Hiroshima are written off, or areas that have any nuclear impact, like uh, Chernobyl, and you got Fukushima. Um, so, what's the tactical nukes? Can you explain those in a little bit of detail, if if you have the knowledge on that? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, were very popular, very popular in the early in the early fifties. Robert Oppenheimer was uh, a strong advocate of tactical tactical nuclear weapons, and uh, he wanted uh, Eisenhower to uh, buy into this uh, Project Vista that he had, and. Uh, Eisenhower would not uh, would not uh, buy into the uh, the Project Vista uh, uh, program uh, that that deeply disappointed uh, Oppenheimer. Uh, but when you're talking about the the tactical nuclear weapons in the 50s and in the and in the early 60s, you're talking about. Uh, Davy Crockett's, which are rather small and are used at the at the field level, uh, and then you've got um, the uh, Honest Johns, uh, and on the Russian side you have uh, other uh, tactical nuclear weapons that are uh, launched ballistically, uh, and it, it, it's it's kind of ironic when I was reading the about the Russian tactical nuclear weapons, uh, their free rockets over ground, you're talking about, you know, warheads with uh, uh, anywhere between one kiloton to uh, 10 kilotons. Some are even smaller than, than one kiloton. The Davy, the Davy uh, Crockett is probably about uh, half a kiloton. Uh, but when you're talking uh, keep in mind when you're talking about a 10 kiloton or a 15 kiloton or an 18 kiloton tactical nuclear weapon, which are relatively small, you're talking about the same size of of a weapon that uh, the United States dropped on uh, Hiroshima, uh, a Fat Man and Little Boy, and oh. that killed that killed. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people and had such a lasting effect. And, and I mean, you know, look at that. And then, you know, people just don't seem to realize that when you're talking, you know, 200 kilotons, which is, is a, you know, a large, large, large tactical nuclear ballistic weapon that the Russians had, you know, for theater war, uh, you're talking about <laughs> devastation, devastation that, you know, would, would uh, certainly would would certainly uh, have a, a long lasting effect on the atmosphere. Uh, you know, not necessarily nuclear winters. Some scientists have started to debunk that, but more more nuclear famine uh, than nuclear winter. And uh, 
but the the uh, the even in 1961. Um, uh, Robert McNamara in December of 61 sent 171 uh, Davy Crockett's to field commanders in uh, in uh, the uh, uh, East uh, German uh, uh, area or West German area, I mean, and a uh, uh, very dangerous situation because, I mean, if you've got a, uh, a group that's being overrun and they have a Davy Crockett, well, they're probably going to use it, and once they use once they use that nuclear that tactical nuclear weapon, um, the the Soviets uh, are going to answer with their own tactical nuclear weapons, and they had a a robust uh, uh, plethora of 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 uh, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, and I put mm. that in uh, uh, I think book three. Uh, and explained quite a few of the tactical nuclear weapons that would have been employed in, in that era. But I mean, they're still with us today. Um, you've got to, you've got to think that, uh, the Ukraine is ripe for a tactical nuclear weapon any day now. And, and, you know, when that happens, I think you're going to see some worldwide panic. Not when it happens, if it happens. So, so you think there's a, so you think there's leg, a, a legitimate, risk that Putin would go to that length of um, of, of escalation? Oh, uh, I think without a doubt. Really? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I just don't think. I mean, if it looks like Russia's losing the uh, the Ukraine war and um, and uh, he's he's probably going to stake take the next step up what I call the escalation ladder and and uh, um uh, as as he goes up that as he goes up that step then it 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 uh well i i've heard that i've heard that the response from nato at that point would be we're going to sink the baltic fleet okay well what do the russians do after you sink the baltic fleet okay um uh I, i'm just not i'm just not sh i'm just not sure uh, or, or excuse me, not the Baltic fleet, the Black Sea fleet. Okay, uh, so I mean, you start escalating, and 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 where does it where does it end? I mean, when you get to the when you get to the final the final rung, like we almost did in in 1962, um, the people at that point did not understand the uh danger and and what would happen to the to the climate and the atmosphere um if they uh if they set off 7347 megatons of of nuclear weapons like we had set out in our our psyop single integrated option plan that was developed and and I wrote extensively about in uh my uh, uh, JFK first strike blog, the, the five the five parts there. So uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely it's definitely a danger, and um, I'm not really sure, other than minimal preparations, what the you know what the uh, uh, what a person should do. Uh, the, I I did I did specify in one of my blogs what you can do, and it's fairly easy. Uh, and that might get you through the that might get you through the first thirty days, which were where the radioactivity is going to be the greatest. I'm onto that, I'm sure. I'm onto that, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the other risk, I suppose, with uh, with a launch from Russia is the it's it's kind of what was portrayed. Well, it is what was portrayed in Doctor Strange, but on the US side, where you get a rogue, you get a rogue senior commander who takes matters into his own hands and decides that he is going to bring about a nuclear strike against uh, against the, the enemy. I'm completely yeah. misreading the situation. And I think, now, as long ago and as great a film as Doctor Strange Love was, that Russia seems like a much more likely place where that, that could could tip, could happen. I don't know. I think, I mean, the reason, the reason I asked about the likely, what you think about the likelihood of Putin doing it is because I, I find it so hard to re, to try and understand what 
is being made out to be a legitimate threat and what and what actually isn't and is being dramatized somewhat just because of the way the news is and the way <coughs> excuse me geopolitics is um uh and on the, I mean, on the rogue, on the rogue general front, I wouldn't like to think that would be. A, I don't know. I think they'd be too afraid of Putin to want to do that. To be able to well, that well, you, you know, we have to, we have to realize, you know, we've got, we've got people all over the world inside these silos, okay, <laughs> and and all it takes. All it takes is one guy with a with a revolver, or or I suppose they can't get down in there with a revolver or something that that knows the the codes. And I suppose it, it takes at least two people to know the codes. But you got the same situation on board, probably. Oh, uh, I would suspect at least two hundred nuclear submarines between the Soviet Union, the United States, the UK, France. Um, India uh, also, you know, developing, you know, nuclear submarines. China certainly has some nuclear submarines, although I think they're too noisy to cause as much of a problem. Um, but that particular that particular uh, danger is 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 out there all the time, and and there's, you know, for the most part, um, how do you? How do you demilitarize, or how do you how do you take all the nuclear weapons worldwide and and uh, do away with them uh, on a voluntary basis where there's a uh, where there's a uh, 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 an authority that 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 would go that would go and verify? Uh, you can't. You certainly can't. Have the UN tasked with that particular uh, with that particular uh, job because uh, uh, I mean as 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 laudable as the goals of the UN have been they they just certainly have have had a lot of a lot of failures along with a lot of successes uh, but. You know, it it it's just too big of a job now. It's kind of like you take the difference in in gun violence between the UK and the US. Well, and and you know, you look at you look at the situation in the US and you try to rectify it. You can't do it. The you, you know, there's just there must be you know. Um, what, 100 million, 200 million handguns in the United States, at least. And, <laughs> you know, that's the, the same situation with the illegal alien, the illegal, uh, the, and I, I guess the, the, a lot of people like to call them immigrants. Uh, I call them illegals just basically because I think there's a legal way to get into the country in an illegal way. And, but I mean, when you're looking at, um, you know, five, six million a year coming in and, you know, 26,000 of them are from uh, China or, you know, uh, other countries that may or may not wish you ill. I, I just don't see how you can, uh, uh, how you can allow that to, to happen. Uh, I mean, you have to have borders or you don't have a country in my opinion. So do you think so um on the subject of the the nuclear armament controller reduction, so you had the uh, strategic arms limitation talks agreements, right? That was the Soviet Union and, and America, wasn't it? So do you do you see that as a futile do you see those kind of initiatives as futile or not? Like I don't see them as futile. I, I've got a graph or a chart that I looked at that showed that I think that there were um, something around 60,000 uh, nuclear warheads um, at, uh, at the peak in the 80s. And I think that they've been reduced to the point where, uh, to the point where, you know, the megatonnage is uh, limited to 800 megaton, 800, uh, not megatons, but 800 kilotons. Uh, 
And so there's probably been some good done, you know, with those treaties, okay? Uh, but, you know, there's still uh, too much out there in terms of the ability to uh, completely uh, annihilate and and uh, do away with uh, civilization. I mean, just think about it. Just think about what a single EMP would do uh, to the United States if, uh, you know, if uh, Kim Jong-un gets uh, uh, an ability for a re-entry vehicle. At the present time, North Korea does not have a, uh, a re-entry vehicle. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm certainly, you know, wondering if at some point uh, they may not just try to knock out the electric grid, which can easily be done, uh, you know, with a, uh, with a, uh, uh, you know, one or two megaton weapon that would be exploded, you know, 150, 250 miles uh, above the ground. And uh, if you've ever been without electricity for an expended period of time, you probably don't like it. Uh, and uh, that's that's one of the things that uh, one of the things that uh, I'm I'm kind of uh, afraid of. And then. The other danger that I see is uh, prolif uh, pro proliferation to countries that are not, they're not, um, not necessarily that they're not equipped or that they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have these, these, these weapons. I mean, you know, I, I can't say, hey, the United States should be the only person that has nuclear weapons because uh uh, you know, they're a, a fair and honorable country when you when you look at what went on in Selma, Alabama, and other places. You know, during the uh, during the integration and 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 the history of our country is is not uh, you know pure. But I, I I'm I'm looking at I'm looking at um, the uh, death to America and uh, uh, chants like that that come from. Uh, Iran and 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 other countries and and what's going on in in the Middle East now and uh, I just don't think that uh, uh, Iran's going to be allowed to uh, deploy nuclear weapons. I, I just don't think that that that's probably going to happen. Um, although I, I'm not sure that uh, you know how the next election is going to come out. And I've already tipped my hand that I, I don't care for Biden. I'm not necessarily a Trump fan either. I actually uh, supported uh, uh, Nikki Haley, but uh, <laughs> she didn't do so well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I certainly probably if it comes down to Trump or to, uh, to Biden, um, uh, you know, I, I certainly do not favor uh, Mr. Biden and his policies towards Iran, where he's allowed them to rearm themselves to uh, uh, facilitate uh, attacks by the Houthis and to uh, uh, fund Hezbollah and, and, and things like that. When you say facilitate attacks by the Houthis, do you mean that through the, the, the not the funneling, the, that uh, financial basically through Israel to Iran? And then yeah. To the Houthis. yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm. I'm. I'm saying that. I'm saying they've supplied. You know. I don't think the Houthis, uh, Hout, Houthis, uh, or Hezbollah, or any of those other uh, factions have come up with uh, uh, sophisticated drones like the drones that uh, that killed the three U.S. soldiers a few days ago. So, uh, I think that. Uh, Iran certainly a, a a bad actor out there, uh, and of course the moment that uh, the moment that we come into conflict conflict with them, uh, you know, uh, Putin's going to and has has uh, you know actually moved politically towards towards Iran, and uh, 
you know, very possibly uh, they're they're happy that we have, uh, uh, you know, the problems that are going on in the in the Middle East because it takes uh, some of the uh, pressure off of uh, the uh, Ukraine area. Mm, I'm very surprised that conflict with Iran hasn't happened already. I, I maybe what we're in 2024. I I was saying it just after the Iraq War. 2003, which I, I took part in, um, I was saying it just after that, is that I, I think at the time, just looking at the looking at the map and seeing where the West was um, active at the time and making noises about going and uh, and having a presence, in, it didn't look very good for Iran at the time. And I'm surprised it hasn't come sooner. But I think uh, the world has been a very turbulent place in other part in, in other areas. I mean, I was also surprised. I've also I'm also surprised that how 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 significantly the conflict in in Gaza and Israel Palestine has ramped up over the last uh, what was it October the seventh was it the attack uh, just like document I think um, I think uh, that was totally unexpected and through a through maybe through a spanner in the works of whatever intent there was from either the Russian side or or the US side where um, Ukraine was concerned. But it, I just feel like, and this is why it's really interesting to talk to you now around the subject of you know nuclear weapons and, and threat, I just feel like we're in, we're in like a tinderbox at the moment, I think, um, where anything could just go, just the, it could take just the wrong political actor, it could take the wrong accidental situation. It could take something like a natural disaster to tip it over the edge towards a, a, a full blown conflict of some sort, you know, major World War Three style and not necessarily nuclear, but it would bring us ever closer. That's my worry at the moment. It's just very, very dangerous. Um, very concerning, very concerning. But trying to navigate all of the all of the information and things that get thrown up to understand just how significant it could be is really difficult. Again, which is why I went for your your time today. How did you, how did you, um, why, how did you get into the interest in in nuclear, nuclear arms, weaponry, and the history of it? I know you touched on it at the start, you touched on it in, touched on it in the icebreaker, but, you know, you've you've gone full-blown into it, like, all in. Where, Where did that start for you? Um, that started for me, um, right after, uh, well, actually it started for me historically, uh, right after, uh, World War II when, uh, the, uh, uh, NATO, uh, forces had about five active divisions and the Russians had 175 active divisions, uh, and uh, they never disarmed, and uh, the United States uh, soldiers uh, couldn't get home fast enough, and I didn't blame them. Uh, and uh, we kind of totally dis- disarmed, and uh, Stalin, of course, had the uh, seven, uh, uh, you know, Eastern Bloc countries. And uh, I looked at that situation, and, and I said, okay, um, Nobody really uh, among the allies wants to spend the money or the time or the effort to uh, put up, you know, 50 divisions, which would which would be necessary for the defense of of Western Europe. And uh, they said, "Okay, we're going to depend upon the uh, nuclear the nuclear deterrent that the uh, that the uh, United States has, and that will hold Russia at bay. Uh, and if you get into some historical facts, um, you're talking about uh, Stalin was was very happy with uh, the results of Czechoslovakia. The Russian playbook was to go into these countries and to. Uh, get them uh, to the point where they were maybe 30 or 40 percent, you know, communist for their political party and then send in the secret police 
to uh, get them over the top. And that happened with uh, Czechoslovakia was the last one in about 1948. And so he saw where that policy was not working and I became, you know, you know, historically, if I would have been there, I would have been alarmed at the fact that, that, uh, uh, what happens if there is a, a Russian conventional attack? How's it going to be blunted? And they talked about, uh, de defense places like the Fulda Gap and other places in, in, uh, uh, West Germany, and I became interested about uh, well, how would this nuclear how would this nuclear deterrent be deployed? And I saw that it was going to be deployed by the uh, B twenty nine uh, silver plate bombers uh, to start with in nineteen in nineteen forty eight forty nine forty six forty seven and uh, I, so I looked at the silver plates and I said, well, there's 60 of those and the United States has all of these war plans that are drawn up like off tackle broiler and all the rest of them. Uh, but they don't have the, they don't have the nuclear bombs to drop, <laughs> you know, they're just on paper. And so I, uh, I thought, well, you know, that's probably not going to work. So the United States came up with this B 36 bomber which was 270 feet across and it had and it had 19 foot uh, uh, propellers mounted on the back of the wings and it was a you know it was just a pig and it was a disaster but it it, it was supposed to be the nuclear deterrent okay and and why did why did the b 50 why did the b36 come into being well Stuart Symington who uh, Stuart Symington was the uh, uh, Secretary of the Air Force, and uh, Lewis Johnson uh, was the uh, Secretary of Defense. And uh, between the two of them, they had all of these ties with cons consolidated con or Convair Consolidated Volte Aircraft Company, and so they they uh, pushed this B thirty six through, and um, it was a, a disaster, and so I said, "Well, there must have been some CIA action that would have that would have convinced the Russians that this was a great plane." Okay, and so that's our nuclear deterrent: this B thirty six that's a, that's a, a, a piece of garbage, and uh, uh, you know, it's supposed to be able to fly through. The MiG 15s and uh, and drop these bombs, uh, but it it really couldn't, in my opinion. And at at that point, I think Russia had an open window to take over Western Europe if they would have wanted to, because I think the nuclear deterrent was just on paper. And so I I looked at that, and I I looked at the whole history. Uh, you know, I said, well, you know, when did, when did the United States or when did the NATO, uh, NATO, uh, forces close that gap? And I think they closed it when the, when the, uh, British developed, uh, their bombers and the United States developed the, uh, B-47. And I think that those were more capable bombers uh, just before the B-52 became active in, in the mid-50s. So I was, I was always looking for um, who had the, uh, who had the, uh, the opportunity uh, for a first strike. And, and I was very interested as to, as to uh, who would have had that, uh, who would have had that opportunity to actually uh, have a successful first strike. Uh, and uh, because of the tactical nuclear weapons that we talked about, um, it still would have been, it still would have been an amazingly uh, terrible, terrible time for the world. Uh, and it's kind of like Eisenhower said, like I alluded to earlier, you just can't have those kind of wars anymore. You have to have these limited wars that we're having now in the Ukraine, we're having now in Gaza, we're having, uh, you know, in, in other places in the world between India and Pakistan. Uh, and, uh, you know, you could point out 
uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of of different minor wars that are that are going on now, and and you you just can't have uh, a, a you know a nuclear war. And so I was I was very interested as to as to when that window would have been open and when it would have closed. And I I uh, uh, it closed for the United States the the first strike window. As I alluded to in part the part five of the JFK blog on my website, it closed for the United States in in uh, uh, 1963 when the Soviet Union uh, developed a, a D4 launcher for their Golf II and Hotel II class submarines, whereby they could launch a uh, a nuclear uh, ballistic missile. Uh, submerged. Before that, the the Soviets were unable to do that, and the United States, in my opinion, uh, from from like 1956 or 57 on, had a clear uh, first strike ability to take out to take out Russia. But the 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 question was, uh, and I pointed it out in that five part blog, was JFK. Uh, when he was faced with the Berlin crisis in 61, started to look at uh, what was called the uh, rowan Kaysen or Kaysen rowan option, which was a, uh, a strike by the uh, B-52s that would have flown with t terrain avoidance radar in at 500 feet uh, under the uh, P-15 uh, Russian radar, which was their low altitude radar, and uh, would have taken out the uh, Plestec uh, four ICBMs, and and if there were uh, you know any more at the uh, uh, Bacchanar uh, Cosmodrome, they would have taken those out. And then you're you're talking about well, what do what do the Russians have left? Uh, so they didn't have the uh, the uh, Hotel Two and the uh, Golf Two uh, nuclear submarines until 63. So in early 63, the United States would have had all of those advantages and would have had a clear window for a first strike, I think, as I pointed out, because there were only, there were only um, 120 uh, TU-95 bears um, that uh, they could have fielded, and uh, there were maybe 60 uh, M4s the Malishnikov, uh, uh, you know, round trip bombers. Other than that, the uh, the Tu uh, sixteen uh, Bison was just a, uh, a barely barely reached the United States, and uh, uh, so they just didn't have even a minimal deterrent at that point. And one of the uh, I think I pointed out in one part in the blog that. Uh, they just did not have even a, a minimal deterrent at that point, and it wasn't until they 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 caught up in 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 65, 66 to the United States that there was uh, mutually assured destruction. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's how I became. You know, it, it was kind of like two heavyweight fighters, and they're they're all you know. Um, they're 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 all talking smack and and you know I'm gonna do this and do this to you and and this and that and Khrushchev was saying oh we're grinding out missiles like sausages and he was of course lying about that and of course we were lying about the fact that that uh, we had uh, all of these uh, nuclear bombs in the early 50s that we didn't have <laughs> and so um, I suppose it, it kind of get, it must kind of get it must get to the point I think you did actually allude to it earlier you know is that you get to a certain number of nukes in your arsenal or in the world and it's just enough to wipe things out if a, if, a, if a conflict starts. So it must get to a point where the the effect and the power that an influence on, on your enemy or enemies has by just increasing your arsenal becomes less and less as it gets to a certain level anyway. And I suppose it's more about, maybe it's more about the unpredictability of the person or the perceived unpredictability of the person who are, who has the ability to launch a strike in the first place, Pew, you know, Putin prime example, as I thought, talking about it earlier, it's like to me, it's just an unknown quantity. Is he as unstable or potentially um, uh, risk averse as we were talking about as as he as he's being made out, or is he not? Is he actually 
someone in the back of his mind thinking, trying to minimize the risk of nuclear conflict because he doesn't want to risk wiping everybody off the face of the planet. Um, if, in fact, sorry, just, to, just to digress slightly, we're talking here about nation states having the ability to launch nuclear attacks and these are armaments, right? What about the ability for non nation state, other organizations, such as terrorist organizations, to launch something like a dirty bomb attack or a nuclear attack. Is that realistically a possibility a possibility that should be of concern or not? Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. I think that uh when you're talking about when you're talking about uh the ability of of uh terrorist organizations to uh you know, make dirty bombs and to set those off in the middle of New York City or London, I, th I think that's a that's a very realistic, a very realistic possibility. And, and then, you know, they could certainly claim, uh, you know, claim uh, uh, credit for for doing that. Uh, so that's a that's a, a, a distinct possibility. And the, the question is, is uh, um, when does that when does that ability come up when does that ability come about and I think it's already it's already uh, there it's just a it's just a question of when it's when it's going to happen and and what the uh, what the response is going to be uh, so I think that as the world uh, evolves in the, over the next uh, 20 to 30 years uh, you're going to see, uh, that ability, uh, you know, I mean, right now, let, let's look at what the Hooties are doing right now. Okay. I mean, they've got, they've got drones that are, that are beyond, beyond what, what we thought were ever going to be uh, possible for any terrorist organization to have. Um, and so that could just be the tip of the iceberg because you've got, uh, you know, if you've got the technology, to do that, to do that drone, uh, you know, I would I would say that you're going to have uh, an ability to uh, increase or enhance that drone technology, and and perhaps uh, you know go with a nuclear weapon at some point. But so, that is that not state sponsored uh, capability they've got there? Because my assumption would be on the on the nuclear. And the dirty, yeah, you know, and the dirty bomb uh, uh, capability for a terrorist organization. I would think that would have to be to be enabled. That would have to be state sponsored as well, right? I, I'm assuming because it's it would be so difficult to get the one the uh, materials uh, needed to to put something together, and two, get the expertise needed in the team to put something together. I can't see it happening without it being state sponsored and i can't imagine even in this world a nation state being that reckless that they would want to provide that capability to a terrorist organization that they haven't got the reins on like their their own military uh, organization maybe i'm wrong i don't know what do you think um well i'd have to i'd have to differ with you on that one you uh i, <laughs> I thought I, you might i thought you might <laughs> I, yeah, well I think that when well, I, I I take those people quite literally when I see them them uh, you know shouting death to America and and I think that uh, I think that if they if they could um, they would uh, they would certainly um, drop a uh, drop a bomb in uh, south in the southwestern United States let's say. Phoenix or Dallas or or somewhere like that where uh, you get across the border um, uh, or you you come you you, you know some of the uh, some of the nuclear weapons that the uh, 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 are employed across the uh, world now are certainly you know mobile there the the Chinese as I pointed out in in book uh, three, Armageddon, they have these nuclear weapons that uh, are on tractor trailers. Okay, uh, and I mean, so a, a ship, a ship comes ashore uh, somewhere in uh, in uh, Mexico or or uh, 
somewhere else, and I'm I'm certain that uh, you know uh, a tractor trailer can be hauled on a ship, and and a small you know relatively small what it, you know it might be a hundred megaton weapon that uh, you know has a two hundred mile range like the uh, like the uh, Russian tactical nuclear. Uh, uh, weapons that are that are ballistic and and uh, you could certainly land that on 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 Phoenix and and kill uh, you know a million people within within uh, you know two or three minutes. So uh, I'm very uh, I guess I'm not very sanguine about the future of of nuclear uh, you know non non pollute proliferation and you know there was a time when kennedy uh when kennedy talked to uh, khrushchev and said uh, hey uh china's developing a nuclear bomb kennedy was so anti-proliferation that he actually tried to talk to khrushchev about bombing the chinese nuclear facilities in like 1963 uh before he was assassinated um you know that's you know relatively unknown by most people, but um, and then you have you you have the uh, uh, 1985 uh, uh, Russian uh, guy that was monitoring the radar. You know on the close calls, like I wrote in one of my blogs, he's monitoring the and and he sees five blips coming across. Okay, his duty at that point was to go down and to report it to the military. Okay. He didn't do it because he said, oh, they're not sending just five. And sure enough, the Russians had, they were putting up a, a, a new kind of uh, early detection system and it was a blip. Okay. But had he gone down and, and reported that, they would have gone to whatever their DEFCON 2 or 1 is and, and readied their nuclear weapons for firing. We would have noticed it with our satellites. Hey, they're opening their silo doors. Uh, and it's just it's just one of those things that once it happens once it happens it's done you know it's not like it's not like something you can undo okay because once it once it does happen uh or, or if it if it does happen you just can't undo it and I, I we've got people walking around and i know people in in des moines iowa walking around with their children they're going to volleyball games today they're you know enjoying life etc and i'm not sure you know i i when i sent you my my outline i gave you some some joseph conrad and some other stuff and i i'm just not sure that they understand and I guess I, I think they should. I think they should understand, and I think they should realize that. I think people are just too lost up in their daily lives to pay enough attention to this, and that's that's where I'm at. But, 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 but what do you? What's the what's the suggestion there? Is that they shouldn't be going to these places, built up areas, and events? No, 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 no. I'm I'm just suggesting that they should make a tiny part of their life, a tiny part of their <laughs> life. Uh, devoted to the non-proliferation -prol and and the reduction of of nuclear nuclear arms and and more safeguards for the nuclear arms and 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 things like that and we can do what we can do on our side uh, and until Plato's uh, five forms of government come through I think that you know Plato had indicated that. You know, you start off with an uh, with an aristocracy, which is overthrown by a democracy. You know, a democracy is basically a military unit. So I would see that I would see Putin being overthrown by, uh, you know, uh, uh, another military junta that that, you know, if he's actually going to give the order to fire that nuclear weapon, they may depose him and take him out. I sure I sure as heck hope they do. So. Mm -hmm. That's my particular, you know, my particular point. And then, you know, you would have maybe maybe the military in charge over in Russia, which I would rather have them in charge rather than Putin. Mm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so maybe. You, I mean, <laughs> you don't want. 
maybe you don't want to go there, but I, I've got a little more faith in their in their military than I do in than I do in in in, in Putin. Yeah, I get it. I get what you're saying. I don't necessarily disagree with you. I think I just sometimes I tend to see, I I don't know. I tend to think Putin is just the more stable leader, one of the more stable leaders in the world at the minute. Believe it or not, when it comes to um, when it comes to foreign policy, believe it or not, no. when it comes to you know interventionist foreign policy for sure. And I just don't history, but then. Then well, I also think I also think oh, okay, but it's also Russia, <laughs> and all of the and all of the history goes there, and everything that and everything and all that history and everything that goes into making Putin who he is today and where he is today and the reasons behind that. He is not a simple individual, as in simple, sim oh, simply no. constructed individual. Incredibly complex, you know, yes, and uh, incredibly smart too. Yeah, I'm incredibly smart. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you a question there, and I can't remember what it was. Oh, I was going to, it wasn't a question I was going to say. I, I, I agree with you, you know, I, I, on, in terms of control and risk management uh, of uh, armaments around the world, you know, and there needs to be, there needs to be an improved collaboration between the, everybody who does and doesn't have nuclear arms, right, but predominantly between the people who do, do have nuclear, nuclear capability, because to your point, no, you can't eliminate, you know, same with gun control, right? No, you can't eliminate um, people's ability to have access to that capability, that lethal capability, talking about nuclear arms. But the more control measures you put in place, you can certainly mitigate the risk of something really bad happening. You can reduce the probability of something really bad happening or the frequency of really bad things happening, right? Um, uh, I mean, look, you know, look at, Got the gun control. Look at what the US would be if there was zero gun control whatsoever, because sometimes people make out there's no gun control in America, and it certainly is. But if there was nothing there at the moment, it would be carnage, right? And at the minute, it's carnage in certain places sometimes at a certain frequency. It'd be worse. You know. Um I think the question I think the question is on the nuclear front is oh man, I, I, we've gotten so close like last year, we talked about it earlier. We've gotten so close, closer than we've ever been, maybe since since the sixties, or maybe a bit later, seventies, eighties. Um, things that we don't know about in terms of the risk of nuclear conflict. We got so close last year. We're still re relatively close now compared to previous years. How do we how do we pull it back uh, from that? How do we reduce that risk, and then how do we pick up that conversation and and, and move away from that proliferation of other countries getting nuclear arms and 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 uh, on um, the the number of weapons that countries who already have them have, what, like what what do we do? What do we do, Thomas? How do we how do we rein it back in? What do you think? Well, you go from uh, the point where McNamara sent the Davy Crockett's, which were controlled by field commanders, you know, colonels. Uh, nothing wrong with Colonel, but uh, you know, having him decide when to fire a nuclear weapon is is kind of uh, beyond my belief that that McNamara would have done some would have done something like that, but he did. Uh, you you have to you have to get the public aware of the gravity of setting off. Uh, nuclear weapons. You have to get them educated to the point that, okay, this is what happened at Hiroshima with the 15 kiloton weapon. And do you understand the difference between the 15 kiloton weapon and a 150 kiloton weapon? That's 10 times more powerful. Do you, do you, I mean, should we send kids through, through school and make them look at the Alan Wellerstein website and and take a look at, you know, what a single 20 megaton weapon, a single 20 megaton weapon does in New York City in terms of, in terms of the four or five million people dead and in terms of the other four or five million people that suffered from third degree burns. And just how, how fast this mushroom cloud uh, explodes and what the force is 
and make them watch a film uh, of some of the uh, of some of the test. I think that it, it's education, uh, and it has to begin at a very early. It has to begin at a very early age, and I think it should be required uh, everywhere everywhere in, in the United States uh, and everywhere in the UK. So. Uh, I think we have to be leaders in that particular in that particular area, and I, I think that that the people <clears throat> in other countries uh, will will follow. Uh, I, I I think that I think that once you know we get the education going here in the United States, the UK, uh, Aust- you know, other areas as well. Uh, the education is is the primary primary part of it. The Chinese students that come over to the UK or to the United States to study, uh, they're they're well aware of 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 what what happens. And China has pursued a fairly responsible pol- policy up to this point in terms of. Uh, nuclear warheads. Uh, you know, they have maybe ten uh, percent of what the United States uh, has. They have maybe ten percent of what Russia <laughs> has. But they have what's called minimal deterrence. You don't need you don't need six thousand you know warheads or six thousand ICBMs um, or other uh, other type of nuclear weapons to keep somebody from attacking you. The, the more weapons you have, the more uh, chances you have that, that someone is going to be able to set off one of those, despite the fact that you've put in all the permissive action lengths, you've done everything that you can to keep people from, to keep people from setting those off. So, I think it's primarily uh, uh, an education factor, and I think when when Biden goes over and and he's palling up with uh, with uh, uh, Zai uh, uh, or some of the other some of the other leaders uh, in some of the other countries, that could be put to the top of of his agenda. Um, let's let's take a look at this let's let's educate let's educate people on on what happens and let's let's see how many how many uh other factors we can put in to keep uh to keep uh you know dirty bombs from happening to keep someone from getting a uh uh a uh, tractor trailer combination with a with a uh, df41 uh intercontinental ballistic missile on it that China has, uh, or you know, anywhere else. I think that's that's the answer. I I think the I think that the world population can be educated on that, because I mean, after all, what do you need in terms of in to, in terms of nuclear deterrence, other than your you know your submarines? Um, I, I'm not really sure that I'm not really sure that you need much else. Um, your land-based and your your uh, uh, your bomber-based and 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 actions like that, I I, I guess are are fine for uh, limited wars. But I mean, I, I just don't think you can fight a limited nuclear war. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we've got um, we've got about ten minutes left. I want to pick your brains on a couple of other things if you don't mind. Which are not nuclear, um, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, mentioned Biden a couple of times. We touched on the immigration thing. Why do you, why do you do you have a do you have any opinion on why the the administration there is treating the the southern border as it is at the moment in terms of allowing it to be porous and seeming to be moving away from correct or effective border control as opposed to towards it. Yeah, I, I've got an opinion on that. And my opinion probably is is rather uh, cynical. Um, I think that, I, you know, after all- I think all, it has to be. I think it has to be. Any opinion of why they're doing what they're doing, if they're doing it deliberately, I think it has to be cynical. I, I can't see it yeah. the other way. You know? Yeah, uh, I, I think that, th- 
the uh, the hope is to have a one party system here in the United States, and by doing that, I by by opening the border, I think that um, the the aim is to turn Texas from a uh, purple state into a blue state. And uh, after that's done, I, I think that the electoral map will be pretty clear for the uh, for the Democratic Party. I have nothing against the, uh, you know the Democratic Party. I'm a registered Republican, but I was raised a Democrat. My dad was a union truck driver, um, provided for all seven of us kids out on the farm with with uh, you know dental insurance and everything else. And and uh, I I'm all for you know. Uh, you know, a, a, a working person getting a, a good, fair living wage, uh, and for a lot of a lot of the things that the, that the Democrats are for. But I I, I just can't I just can't abide by uh, trying to eliminate at least a two party system. I actually wish the United States had at least five or six political parties that were viable so that they could form coalitions. Right now they have, right now we have two diametrically opposed uh, parties. And the problem is this, the problem is uh, you get the radical parts of each party that control their uh, primary process. Okay, and there's no room for a moderate to to be nominated by one of these parties because the base of each party is to the Democratic Party is a little left of center, and the base for the Republican Party is middle or far right of center. And the the problem with that is if you're a moderate Republican or a Jim Leach Republican or someone or someone like that, then you cannot you cannot uh, have really a say in who your candidate is going to be. So if we had a system where there were, you know, several different parties and you had to form a coalition to get something done, then and a coalition to decide who the who your leader was going to be, we would have a better government. But but we don't. And so I, so I think that the open borders are an attempt to first of all get millions of of immigrants in and hoping that they'll identify with the, with the Democratic Party and that and then legalizing them. Uh, at some point, there's been a lot of talk about legalizing the. Uh, 12 to 13 million, uh, you know, illegal immigrants that are in in the United States, but I'm certain that there's there's more like 20 million than there than than I mean, just this last year, uh, we've had, um, you know, probably two or three, maybe four million in. So um, hmm. that's that's kind of why I think we have our open border policy. Okay, last last couple of questions. Back onto the nuclear subject. Um, where do you think, where, as in which state, do you think a nuclear attack, tactical or not, is most likely to come from? Um, if it if there is one in the next year or so, I'm assuming you're going to say Russia. Right? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm not so sure that uh, that it, it it couldn't be. It couldn't be North Korea. Um, really? Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm thinking that. I'm thinking that uh, the uh, the uh, government there is, is maybe a little bit more unhinged than than the Soviet than the Soviet Union. Um, and when they do uh, acquire a reentry vehicle for their for their missiles. Uh, I don't really, I don't really know whether or not, um, you know, they're going to uh, become a part of the world community as of as of this time. Uh, you know, they they just 
uh, are not, and I'm not really sure that China can control them. Maybe China can and maybe they can't, but I'm sure that there'll be a lot of nuclear blackmail one way or the other um, from uh, North Korea, and if they don't get what they want, then what will they do? Uh, so, Surely that would be signing their own death warrant. Surely, I mean, he must see that. I think Kim Jong Un, he must see that. that if he launched. I mean, they're so weak, comparatively speaking, to the, the there is what you would assume their targets would be, uh, or the allies of their targets would be. That the retaliation against North Korea, they launched an attack against I don't know U.S. or on U.S. soil. That it would just wipe them off the face of the planet. Surely. I just well, I can't see. I can't see how you could draw a logical. Not you. How they could come to a logical conclusion that a first strike from themselves would be a good idea. <laughs> well, no, no, no. There's, it's, there's nothing to do with logic about it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's certainly, you know, it's certainly a possibility. I think, and the other mm. possibility, um, you know, comes with the uh, uh, Taiwan Straits. Um, that's always been a a hotbed since uh, Eisenhower, uh, uh, Kumoy, and and some of the other islands there, uh, and the the fact that uh, uh, the U.S. is maintaining a a high naval presence in that area, and uh, the fact that uh, if Taiwan is is attacked with conventional weapons uh, and invaded, what is the response of the United States uh, or uh, the NATO? I mean, don't we face, don't we face another uh, uh, type of uh, Western Europe situation where if Stalin would have started his troops, that uh, you know we really don't have the conventional the conventional uh, assets in place in uh, Taiwan to repel a a uh, a Soviet uh, I'm not, I mean a, a Chinese attack uh, and you I'm know not sure I'm not sure we'd have the appetite to go and defend it as we have with Ukraine though I I, and, I mean maybe I'm being a bit ignorant in terms of what uh, you know how China taking Taiwan would affect us as in the West economically, but but aren't aren't the signif aren't the majority of Thai the people in Taiwan are they not uh Han? Are they not genetically Chinese? They're chi they're chi of Chinese descent, aren't they? The majority of them. I think so. I think so. But I think if you look at their last election, there was a repudiation of mainland China by the election of by the election of their their democratic uh, their democratic leader and, and the repudiation of the uh, main, uh, mainland mainland Chinese candidates. So um, I I think that uh, um, if they if they do if they do take them. Um, I, I guess that I, I view Taiwan, I guess, from a, from a political standpoint as more of a democratic country and, and less, uh, <clears throat> less corrupt than the Ukraine. So that's just my opinion. And, and, and quite frankly, if you pressed me on it, I may not have many facts to back up my opinion. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you could, maybe you could talk about that on a, on a, on a future podcast. I certainly much more I'd like to talk to you about. I'd also I'd like I'd love to talk to you about um, if you would on a, uh, um, on a next time is your 25, 25 years as a judge and and that experience there and what you know and your opinions on things now. You know one of the one of the uh, one of the things that really interests me is um, the idea of uh, the the legalization of drugs, for example, and. Um, and I, I'm sure with your experience in dealing with people uh, who have been severely affected by illegal drugs and addiction and things, you'd have you'd have uh, it'd be great to hear your opinion. Well, yeah. I'll give you this. I'll give you the, a real a real good preview on that. 
I am, I am, uh, and and this is going to this may surprise. This may be the most surprising thing that you've heard on this uh, heard from me so far. Uh, I am, I am highly in favor of the legalization of drugs, uh, and uh, you, the reason why is because uh, when I'm a judge and I'm sitting there and a person needs help, okay. Um, and they want help. Uh, I don't have good choices, and the states in the United States individually set up a framework for dealing with mental health issues and with drug issues, and it's abysmal, the facilities are. Okay. Okay. And why, you know, here's what I want to do. Okay. If you watch, well, I watched 60 Minutes one day, and these two guys were out on these speedboats in the Gulf of Mexico, and, and so 60 Minutes came up and said, hey, what are you guys doing? They said, well, we're out here. We're interdicting, uh, you know, drug traffic. And, and they said, well, have you ever caught anybody? No, but no, but we sure like our boats. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, I, I mean, and then and then you take every city, every sheriff's office in the United States, they're, they're busting people for, uh, you know, Marijuana, where it's not legal, uh, you know, cocaine, everything else. I want treatment for people. I want, I want the ability to send them to a facility where they can get well. I had one case where this family came in and, and this, this, they had a daughter that I sent to, uh, Cherokee, which was a, uh, six month facility. And she came back. She had, Got married, had kids, went to college, had a successful life. But she was a terrible, terrible alcoholic until we got her. We got her the the necessary treatment. The necessary treatment out there isn't isn't there right now. So I get mm -hmm. that's just a short preview. It's all right. Let's definitely line that up. Um, please tell people. Well, your website. Uh, you've got some great blogs on there, but a number of them. You, and I hope there's more coming. I really enjoy. I've read the first two, two maybe three so far ahead of this podcast. Really enjoyed them, and I am looking forward to reading the books as well. So please get help with your website, and where they can find your books and anything else you want to plug. Oh well, that's just. I mean, if you go to uh, Amazon and and in the search bar, you just type in uh, Thomas uh, J. Yegi. Uh, the three books will pop will pop up, and they are um, at the present time we're doing pretty well. They are number uh, uh, three, number four, or number two, number three, and number five, I think, in the uh, nuclear weapons and military history section uh, for uh, for Amazon, and uh, so we're doing quite well. Although I certainly would like to get more people to. Uh, read uh, especially book three, the Armageddon book, so they understand uh, and and actually book two, uh, so that they understand the effect of nuclear weapons. I do the Pugwash conference uh, uh, display uh, concerning you know the effect of nuclear weapons and and the aftermath uh, is uh, is is pointed out rather rather well uh, in the end of, of book three. What happens after a uh, what happens after a nuclear weapon is exploded? Well, I'll put the, I'll put the link to your website and the, the Amazon link to your author page in the blurb of this podcast as well. So if people are thinking now you can go straight to the blurb folks and just click on the link and sure. go and find them. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Thank exactly you. Was, exactly as after. I've learned a lot. And Thank you. um and if you uh if you're up for doing it again, let's do it again. I feel there's much more to discuss. Okay. Well thank you, you. I really appreciated uh you having me on, on your uh, on your show. I really did. And and I wanted to say that um I really am impressed with your service to your country and 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 what you did uh, with your life. So uh, I really, uh, I really think you're you're one of the people that uh, I, I would uh, uh, I would certainly look up to. So thank you very much. Thank yes. you very much. Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. No worries. Bye bye. All right.